first thing my dad does when he gets up is go make the coffee. Okay, who wants coffee? I want some coffee. Okay, first I smash the beans. Then I mix them up. And then I pour some cream. And then I heat it up. And then I drink it. Here you go. This is delicious coffee. Thank you. Next he fixes the car. Run. Here you go. Oh, uh, nail. Um, light bulb. All done. Then he probably has to fix the sink, too. Hand me a hammer. Bang, bang, bang. Hand me a pipe. Hand me a popsicle. Why do you need a popsicle? Because it's delicious. He likes to cheer at my sports games. Yeah, kick that ball. Score a basket. Goal! Then he grills the food. What are you grilling us for dinner tonight? Hamburgers. Hot dog. Mac and cheese. Cheese. Mashed potatoes. Strawberries. Raspberries. Blackberries. Mmm, sounds great. Then he prays for dinner. Thank you for our cat, thank you for our friends, and thank you for the world. The friendship never ends. Amen. After dinner, we played games. I played Uno. You want to play Uno? Sure. Yep. A blue five. I have a blue two. A green two. Draw four, 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 draw four. You have to draw 5,024 cards. Then he tells me a story at bedtime. Once upon a time, there was a dragon in the castles. He is a fire-breathing dragon and an ice-breathing dragon. And they all live happily ever ever after. The end. My dad always encourages me. I'm so proud of you. I'll always be there for you. I love you and Jesus loves you very much. You are a really great kid. Happy Father's Day to all the dads. You're the greatest. Yep, thanks, bye. See you later. Break a leg. All right, well, good morning, church. And as Rayleigh said, happy Father's Day. How's everyone doing this morning? Great. Have you had a great morning so far? I tell you what, I have too, and it's only going to get better. Now, listen, one of the things that I love that we've kind of, I don't want to call it a tradition, but we've done this in the past, is where we have a men's choir, all right? So I, I know you might not normally be in the choir. Maybe you've wanted to be in the choir, and this, this is your chance right here. So over this next song, I'm, I'm going to ask all the guys to go ahead and come on down. Now listen, the song that we're going to sing after this song is Victory in Jesus. It's a great arrangement of Victory in Jesus. I love it. You guys, I'm going to encourage you, even before we start the song, come on down. Come on the platform, side stairs, uh, up, up the front here. Yeah, come on, guys, come on. Hey, ladies, go ahead and encourage your man to come forward. Make it feel like it's his idea, but encourage him to come on down. And let's go ahead and stand up right now. And during this song, guys, come on down. Let's fill up the choir lot. Come on, guys. During the song, yeah. the God who evermore will be. You can feel it. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out.
accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the praise. this morning you want to come sing with your dad hey that would be pretty cool that would be awesome it's still not too late come on come on now guys choir we need to stay standing okay so we're going to jump into victory in jesus and this arrangement cooks i'm not going to lie you got to hang with me here band and everything they're on fire and uh, this is going to be an awesome arrangement victory in jesus verse chorus and we're going to kill it all right all right congregation you can go ahead and be seated and listen to these guys you're probably going to want to stand eventually this is going to be awesome but yeah, here we go. Come on, let's cheer on these guys.
Hey, there's a clipboard on the way down. You can sign up. Choir rehearsal Wednesday night, 6.30. You guys sound awesome. Hey, I'm going to ask you to stay up here. We're going to sing another one. And I'm going to do this real quick. Uh, we don't do this often, and I'm stepping out in faith. I'm just be honest with you. I'm going to ask one of these guys to come down and sing this next song. So, Tom, hey, Tom, Tom Racy, brother, <laughs> please do not do me bad here. <laughs> I, I love my job, brother. Uh, I'll sing it with you. Hey, we're just going to sing Speak to the Mountains. All right, awesome, awesome song about our God being bigger, better, stronger, and greater than any mountain we'll ever face. Amen? Hey, ladies, everybody, come on. Let's stand up. Let's join together this morning in worship as we lift up the King of Kings. I got you, Tom. I'm right here, brother. You better. You better. <laughs>
stand a chance against my God. Amen? He is bigger, better, stronger, and greater, greater than anything we will ever face. There's no mountain too high or valley too low that he's not there with us. Amen? Oh, give me a minute. I might just get excited about it. I'll tell you what, didn't these guys sound awesome this morning? My goodness. Hey, guys, I'm, I'm going to ask something of you in just a second. I promise there's nothing worse than, than this is if you've been scared to death. Church family out here, I'm going to ask you to do something as well. Hey, I tell you what, there is no greater privilege as a dad, as a husband, as a father, than to pray for my family. When I can pray for them or pray over them, when I can surround them with my arms and my love and just let them know that I love them, God loves them, they're going to face mountains and valleys in this life, but nothing is too big or too great for our God. When we have the love of our earthly father and the love of our heavenly father. Amen? So guys, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. In the next few minutes, we're going to sing another song here, and I'm going to ask you to come down. And I'm going to ask the families if you would come forward and meet your husband, your dad, your father, your man at the stairs this morning. And I just want our guys, our husbands, our dads, to pray over our families and for our families over the next few minutes as we sing this song. Can we do that this morning? Ladies, I'm going to ask you to move. Families, come on down now. I'm going to ask you to start moving even now. Guys, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and come on down. I want you to wait for your families at the altar this morning. I want you to pray over them. Lift them up in the name of Jesus Christ this morning.
Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness, so the every enemy. Father, thank you. Thank you this morning that we can shout Jesus in the mountain, from the mountaintops and in the streets. Father, we can proclaim the name that is above every name over our families this morning. God, I thank you for your goodness. There's just something about the name Jesus. The 
power in the name of Jesus. At the mere mention of the name Jesus. The atmosphere changes. Father, this morning, I thank you. So we witnessed a group of men on this platform who I'm going to say are serious about leading their family well. I thank you that they came down to this floor and prayed over their family. Thank you that they desire to serve you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Father of fathers. And I'm thankful that in the name of Jesus, Lord, we can lead our families well. Lord, today as we can continue to worship you, Father, as we Lord, lean into you this morning. God, as we crack open the scriptures, your word today. Lord, I pray that we can continue to gain information and knowledge about how we can live a life centered around you and pleasing to you. But God, may we never miss the opportunity to share about you. There are people in this world who are dying without you. And Father, that needs to change. We need to share your love and the gospel with them. So Lord, as we dive into the scriptures today, I'm grateful even now, Father, for what we're going to learn. God, speak to us through your word as it's proclaimed, as it's preached this morning. God, I thank you for it. And I thank you for what you've done in this service. My goodness, Father, how you've already been moving and working in this service. And I thank you in advance for what you're going to continue to do. You are faithful. And Father, I thank you for what you're going to do in the rest of the service. Bless our time, Lord. It's in your matchless name I pray. Amen. Well, happy Father's Day again. Uh, meaningful opportunity to uh, just worship with our families this morning. I'm grateful, uh, grateful for that time of being able to gather as a group of guys and, and pray together and, um, or sing together rather and then pray with our families this morning. Um, we're in the book of Exodus this morning and we, we're kind of leading up to this part that is incredibly familiar. We've been talking about the life of Moses, this leader of the Israelites, who uh, experiences a unique call from God, where the bush is on fire but is not being burned up. Where God says, I've chosen you to lead my people out of slavery and into the land in which I've promised them. And he leads Moses through the, the 10 plagues and ultimately 
They walk out as the Red Sea parts and they cross on dry ground. And there's this chunk of the book of Exodus from chapters 19 all the way through chapters 31 where God is speaking in to the life of Moses. I'll give you a little bit of uh, kind of that sneak peek behind the curtain, and, and that's that normally I plan a sermon series um, way out ahead of time, just knowing the passages that are going to uh, come away. And so normally I, I'll get away at some point during the year and uh, just take time to, to pray and to read commentaries and to kind of walk through how I believe God is just shaping my heart to lead our, our church and to, to lead us forward into what God is calling us to do and thinking about all the different things like Mother's Day or Father's Day or opportunities to uh, send missions teams and as we're thinking about what's coming up with VBS and just beginning to think through the calendar and, and how God might shape our sermon series around that this year. Um, it feels like we've gotten it maybe interrupted a few times and, um, and not that that's a bad thing. I love when the Holy Spirit interrupts us. It's not always convenient, but it's what's best for us, amen? And, uh, and so we've just had some absolutely uh, amazing times, and, and yet we're, we're a little bit behind from what I planned. And maybe that frustrates some people to not be where you planned, not me, my wife's type A, I don't care. Um, but we're behind, and, and so I'm thinking through you know, all right, God, what do you want us to do? What, what, what do I need to hit? What do I not need to hit? And, uh, and Mandy asked me this past week, what, or actually I think it was two weeks ago, what are you preaching on? I said, oh, I'm getting ready to go into Moses, um, encountering God on Mount Sinai, picking up in chapters 19 and 20, and getting into the Ten Commandments. She's like, oh, man, you're getting into the Ten Commandments on, on Father's Day. And she says, I hope you're only covering the first four. I'm like, well, tell me more. <laughs> and she's like, how neat is it that the first four of the Ten Commandments just talk about our relationship with God the Father? How he desires not just to love us, but to be loved in response. And so we enter into Mount Sinai in chapter 19 and Moses, knowing the instructions of God, he goes up to the mountain and God begins to speak over Moses and what is the Mosaic covenant picking up in verse three. It says, while Moses went up to God, the Lord called him, called to him out of the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, thus you should tell the people of Israel it says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people. For all the earth is mine. Check this out. God says, all the earth is mine and I've chosen you to love. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these words that you shall, these are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. God declares in this covenant that you are my people and I have loved you. You have seen how I've sacrificed for you. You've seen how I've carried you. You've seen how I've brought you out of slavery. You know the promise that I'm preparing a place for you. And I'm calling you to love me in return. God the Father loves, loves his people. And he instructs them on how to love them in return. I think it's really neat when we're considering the Ten Commandments, that we're looking at a passage that 
uh, the Jewish rabbis, they, they would call them not the Ten Commandments, but the Ten Words, because when you get into the Ten Commandments, it begins in chapter 20. It says, and God spoke all these words. So these 10 words, these things, these instructions that God is leaving for his people, they're instructions of a loving father instructing his children on how to live and how to love and how to walk in obedience to who God has called them to be. It echoes from the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and as it's repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 11, where God in speaking to Moses says, you shall therefore love your God, your heart, your soul, your might. You shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commands always. He tells them in verse 18, you shall therefore lay up these words that he's giving to his children. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your hearts and in your soul and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, pass them on. This is good for you. Talk about them when you're sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. God says, this is how you love me. So I wanna pause. Because I think sometimes it's really easy for us to say something without without thinking it through. Is that, is that true for anybody else? You, you speak before you think? If I were to ask you, do you follower of Jesus? Do you, church, really love God? really love the Father? You say, well, I would have said yes, but now that you've kind of prefaced it this way, maybe I'm thinking a little bit more about it. Are we a people who have genuine affection for the Father is a question that we need to be asking ourselves because this first part of the Ten Commandments is, is loving God, and the second part of the Ten Commandments is, is learning how to love others, and that we would be the people who love God ought to be something that is absolutely primary, is core, is, is the essence of, of who we are as, as followers of Jesus, and and yet we don't always get this right. Love God and love people, it sounds so simple. And we make a disaster out of both, don't we? So the question that we're asking ourselves this morning is how then do I love the Father well? And so God instructs in the first four of these words, these 10 commandments. He says this, and God spoke all these words saying, verse one of chapter 20, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery, and you shall have no other gods before me or beside me, right? You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord, am your God. I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. And visit the iniquities of the father on the children to the third and to the fourth generation of those who hate me. In other words, if you rebel against God, you will most likely pass that on to those who you are called to be a father. 
The blessing is that, but I'll show steadfast love to the thousand of those who love me and keep my commands. And you should not take the Lord your God, the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. If God is going to hold me guilty for taking his name in vain, I better know what it means to take God's name in vain. That sounds pretty serious. And remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall not do any work, you or your sons or your daughters or your male servants or your female servants or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." So, we're just, you know, looking at these on the surface, and I think it would be very easy for us to be like, we are a people here who are probably doing pretty good, pretty well at loving the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods uh, before me. And you're like, I'm a follower of Jesus. I don't have any other gods before Jesus. I'm not worshiping uh, the Hindu gods or I'm not worshiping the, the Muslim gods and I'm not a follower of, of Buddha and I'm, I'm not an atheist, so I, I got that one down. And I'm like, okay, I've checked. Well, you shall not have any carved images in your household and bow down to carved images and none of you have, you know, statues of, of false gods in your household. And you're like, all right, got that one down, check. I'm loving God well and you shall not take the Lord, your God's name in vain. And you're like, mom told me from a young age that I don't use God's name that way. So I don't use God's name that way. I got that down, check. And let's face it, you're here at church for as long as this guy up here is gonna preach. And so you got that down, check. Remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy. You're like, oh man, boom, I love God. I'm doing well at this. I think there's some ways that we're called to dig in and to respond to Scripture. That we would be challenged as God's people to maybe see God's Word and the depth and the breadth of what God is instructing us as followers of Him. And then to ask questions, am I truly loving God well? God speaks these words, and the very first of the commandments is, you shall have no other gods before me. I think that what God is instructing us as followers of Jesus is that we would love God first, and that we would love God foremost above everything else in our life, that God would be our central and our highest priority of our lives. That we would understand and that the Jewish people in Exodus would understand that if we fail to love God first, failing here, we will fail everywhere. Let me restate that in the affirmative. To succeed in every other arena of life, to succeed as a husband, to succeed as a father, to succeed in my work, to succeed in my play, to succeed in my school, to succeed in my finances, to succeed in my popularity, to succeed in my position, to succeed in any other arena of life. If we fail here, if we do not love God first, then you and I are missing God's very best for us, regardless of what the fluff on the outside actually looks like. Failing here, we fail everywhere. 
And the opposite is always true. Keeping this command will align our hearts with the rest of what God has commanded us. Jesus says that all the commands could be succinctly wrapped up to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. If we're loving God well, we're going to love people well. My vertical relationship and my horizontal relationship are intricately connected. And I'm not able to accomplish God's purpose. Tim, you talked about God's mission for our lives as followers of Jesus. I'm not going to be able to do that the way God has purposed me and gifted me and resourced me if I'm not first aligned vertically with who he's called me to be as a follower of Jesus, to love God first. Say, am I loving God first? It's really interesting. I love one of the way the commentators that I was reading this week uh, said it. He said, when Israel, or she said it, when Israel breaks the first commandment, it's not because they cease to worship God entirely, but rather it's because they cease to worship God alone. When we're reading this trans, these uh, translations, there's a couple ways that this is uh, translated depending on the version of scripture that you might be reading from. And uh, one might translate it, you shall have no other gods before me. And another translation might say, you shall not have any other gods beside me. I believe it's because what we're wrestling with is the command of God is that we would have nothing before God and we would have nothing beside God. We would place nothing above God and we would not allow anything else to come equivocal with God in our lives. I think about Colossians chapter one, which begins to work out for us who Jesus is in the fullness of God. And it talks about Jesus' work in creation and it uses this word that through the years my heart has latched onto where it says in, that, in, that Jesus is preeminent in everything. He is far and exceedingly above all else. And that there is nothing that is in comparison or competition with him. Are there things that are in competition with Jesus in my life? Is he first and far above everything else in my life? I think about being in love. Y'all remember what it was like to be in love? Been married for going on 20 years. I remember what it was like to be in love, still in love with that girl. Thought about her all the time. We hear love songs, you are always on my mind. Let me ask you this, is is God, are you so in love with God that he is always on your mind? Do you love him like that? I thought about the way that our relationship began. I told this story in one of the life groups the other week as we were talking about our relationship to God's word. And um, I remember that, uh, you know, we would often get up and I would read my Bible in the morning, still a practice that um, seek to make sure is an important first part of our days to to read God's word in the morning. And there would be Saturdays or days would come around where it was summer, we were out of school and I'd pick up the phone and I would call Mandy. And uh, we'd begin our conversation and we'd be saying sweet nothings into the phone. Uh, That was back before cell phones were, so you had to be, you know, careful that your dad wasn't gonna pick on you and make fun of you because that phone was still attached to the wall back then. And she'd ask me a question. She'd be like, hey, have you spent time with God? I'd be like, no, I didn't spend time with God yet, but I'm going to get to it as soon as we have a phone call. And all of a sudden, there's a dial tone coming through the line. Like, click. 
that without loving God first, I couldn't love her well, and she knew that. She didn't want to be the first, the most important thing on my mind. She wanted Jesus to be. I believe when we're talking about love, God, loving God first is that it's not just a task on our to-do list. Did my devotion? Check. Said a prayer? Check. Came to church? Check. But there's an intimacy that we're speaking of in this relationship, an affection and a desire to truly say, God, you are my everything. You are my all and all. Love God first. Second command says this, that you should not make for yourself any carved images. And I think that in essence, we're like, I've got this well. I want to word it to you this way, though. One is love God first. Number two is it's all his. It's all his. It's interesting in Romans 1, 22 and 23, it says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the creator God for the creation. How about this? Let me ask you a question. By the way, this is not rhetorical, which means if you don't respond back, I'm gonna look like a fool. So hopefully you'll help me out. You helped him out, I'm counting on you. Number one, Number one is this. Who is your favorite musician? Tim Foose. Man. <laughs> that was Trisha Foose. Tim, you my favorite too. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Who's your favorite musician? Like, all right, I got a favorite musician. How about this? Because you guys aren't speaking very, y'all are debating, you're thinking about it too hard. Who's your favorite movie star? John Wayne. John Wayne. That's a dude. How about this? Who's your favorite sports star? Tim Foose. Y'all don't even know you just made his day and I won't hear about it for the rest of the, you know, <laughs> won't stop hearing about it the rest of the week. It's good. I want you to picture this. You're watching your favorite movie. You're listening to your favorite song. You're watching a replay of the game, your favorite game. And your favorite person walks into the room. And your response is, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me finish watching this first. We substitute the creation for the creator. Does that make sense to you? See, I don't think that we're a people in our culture that have carved images in our, in our houses, in our homes, and yet we have carved out parts of our lives for ourselves, submitting our lives to those things that do not hold eternal value. We love what God has given us more than loving the God who loved us and gave us those blessings. It's all his. There's an old preacher line that says, if you show me your bank account and your calendar, I will show you what is most valuable, what are the idols of your life. What I'm asking you, church, what I'm asking you, follower of Jesus, is have you somehow substituted out enjoying worshiping the creator God who loved you and died for you, who has extended his grace for you for something that is lesser? Do you desire the blessings of God more than you desire the presence of God? 
Is God really the one who you can say, it's all his? One, love God first. Two, it's all his. Three, I'm all his. Can I just go ahead and tell you this? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain has nothing to do, or I shouldn't say nothing, has very little to do with the language that is coming out of your mouth. Though the language that is coming out of your mouth might represent that you are acting in a way that is taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. This idea of the name of the Lord your God, names were incredibly important in the ancient Near East. That's Israel, right? Think about it this way. Names had meaning, and the meaning of the names often reflected the character of the person. It's why God gives Abraham a new name. He changes his name from Abram to Abraham, meaning the father of nations. It reflected the identity that God was placing on Abraham and who he was making him to be. God changes the name of Jacob to Israel, meaning that God perseveres and that we are persevere with God. Names have a meaning. In Acts chapter 11, verse 26 in Antioch, it's the first time that these people who are followers of Jesus are called Christians, and it makes a note of it. And this is the first time that they were called Christians. What did it mean to be a Christian? It meant to be a little Christ or to be like Christ. Let me ask you this. Does your life look like his what you might not know, because I didn't grow up around here, is that my family tends to have certain traits that look very, very similar to one another. As a matter of fact, I've shared the story before that oftentimes, um, you know, every several years, my family will do a family reunion. We'll all go down to Top Sail, or if you're from that area, it's like Topsail. North Carolina, hang out on the beach, and there's like 80 or 100 of us down there. Yes, my family's that big. I don't want to tell you how crazy they are. And from one family unit to the next, when we get near one another, there's something about the way we look that it is identifiable that we are from the same family tree. Whether it's the dark hair or the blue eyes, the olive complexion or the dashing good looks, but I... I got to talk myself up, Tim. You got yours earlier. It's the other side of the family. Yeah. We look alike. Do we look like Jesus? Can we really say that I'm all his? I love Ephesians chapter two, where it talks about who we were, dead, Disgusting, separated, but now we are redeemed and lavished with grace and are called by his name. Actually, the most oft used phrase for those who are followers of Jesus is not that we are Christians, but that we are in Christ. And if we are in Christ, we ought to look like Christ. If I'm loving Christ, my life will look like Christ. Love God first. It's all his, I'm all his. And number four is simply this, it's he is sufficient. It's really interesting when we talk about this text here where it's talking about the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy because there's more text here than any other command that we have in the 10 commandments. I think there's a reason for it because these people are only a month out from being slaves in Egypt. They knew nothing but work. They knew nothing but slaving away to produce the next brick that needed laid on the pile. They knew no rest. 
they knew the next day would not relent. They knew the sun would continue to be exhausting. They only knew straining and striving and strife. And God speaks to them and he says, but I am not like the gods of Egypt. I am not like the gods of the world. I am not like Pharaoh. I give you rest. What does Jesus say? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, for I will give you rest. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. I have come to give you something that the world cannot offer you. It's one of the greatest blessings, but let me go ahead and tell you this, church family. It's also one of the greatest acts of faith that we have as followers of Jesus is stopping and resting in the presence and the sufficiency of the Father. See, the pursuits of the world and the gods of this world, they will demand everything from you. They will suck the life out of you and they will leave you destitute once they've used you all up. But our God is not like that. About a year ago, I preached through a series talking about being on Sabbath, and I went back and I looked at my, my notes. I reminded myself and remind you, when we practice Sabbath, resting in God, when we take a break once a week, it's a reminder that God is the one in charge of keeping the world turning and not me and not you. Solomon says, what do we get for all the toil, the hard labor? Oh, but what we receive in the presence of God, isn't that so much more? When I practice Sabbath and take a break once a week, I'm acknowledging God's right to rule and direct my life as he see fits because his ways are higher than mine. When I practice Sabbath and take a break once a week, it's a reminder that God's great desire for my life is not mechanical responses, completing a checklist, but meaningful, loving, intimate relationship with God who created the universe. When I practice Sabbath and take a break once a week, it reminds me of my own need for God's grace, his salvation, and his redemptive work in my life. When I practice Sabbath and take a break once a week, it reminds me to focus on God's mission because work has value, but there is work to be done that has eternal significance. When I practice Sabbath and take a break once a week, it reminds us that we are people who are created to worship. It is the way we are designed. You will worship something. The question is, will we worship the right someone? And when I practice Sabbath and take a break once a week, it reminds me that I'm not bigger than God. I'm not bigger than God's design for my life and that I need rest and I need worship. He is sufficient to meet my needs. The world will tell you, keep working, do the next thing, produce a little bit more, be a little bit better. And at the end, you might be spent and you might be drained, but they'll keep asking. But God is not like the gods of this world. He says, I am sufficient. I am what you need. You can come to me and I will give you life. See, when I began the passage, am I loving God first? It's really easy for us as followers of Jesus to check the boxes. But as we begin to dive into what God's word was really saying and really instructing us, as people who want to love God, I believe he's calling us to deep and meaningful, abiding relationship with him. 
And that outside of that relationship with God, our lives will remain empty and often stressful, striving, but never satisfying. How are you loving God, church family? Are you loving him well? Is he first? Is it all his? Are you all his? Are you walking by faith in his sufficiency? And if not, maybe this morning during our time of response, there's an opportunity just to come forward and to lay it at the altar. God, I've heard these words of yours. And like a father who's loving me and instructing me, I don't just want to hear them, I want to experience them in their fullness, walk in them by faith, be refreshed by them, sustained by them, because I know you are what I need. Maybe this morning you don't know Christ as your savior. The reality is, is that we cannot love God apart from going through Jesus. His word tells us I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through me, which means there's no salvation outside of him, and those no, there's no experience the fullness of God's love and walking in that love aside from a relationship with him. However the Lord's leading you to respond, I wanna invite you as we sing this morning, Father God, use the next few moments to work in our hearts. God, I know for me, it's easy to say words, but not consider the meaning. So God, make us people that love you well, that you would be first, that you are preeminent, not just over all creation, you are, but in this life, in this heart of mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, let's, let's stand, let's sing, let's worship as we respond this morning to the Spirit's move. given up on me by now I would have labeled me a lost cause cause I feel just like a lost cause if I were you I would have turned around and walked away I would have labeled me beyond repair cause I feel like I'm beyond repair but somehow you don't see me like I do Somehow you're still here. You're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I have ever done could separate. From the God who saves I used to hide Every time I thought I'd let you down Always thought I had to earn my way But I'm learning you don't work that way Somehow you don't see me like I do Somehow you're still
You're the one who runs in my direction When the whole world walks away You're the God who stands With wide open arms And you tell me nothing I have ever done Can separate my heart from the God who saves Aren't you grateful this morning, church, that there's nothing that will ever pluck us out of the Father's hand. Amen? Amen. Well, my goodness, it has been a great morning. Amen? Whew. Guys, you did awesome. Come on. Give yourself a hand. Ladies, give them a hand. It was awesome. Great message about being fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ and how we can live out on mission, what that looks like. I hope you've been encouraged this morning. It has been a great morning. Don't take what you've learned and experienced here this morning and just kind of hold it in. You know, when, when, when it's inside of you and it's just ready to burst out, let it out. Let people know about Jesus. Let people know about Jesus, all right? Is that a deal this week? Can we do that? Just let them know about Jesus and the greatness and the fullness and the faithfulness of Jesus Christ this week. Well, church, let's read our Bible verse this morning, and uh, we'll, we'll go from here. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm half tempted just to say, turn the screens off and do it, by, do it by memory. Do you think we could do it by memory this morning? Or should we go? <laughs> oh, no, no, Lord, no, we couldn't do that. <laughs> They're all like, it's Father's Day, man. Give us a break here. All right. So one more week, and then maybe we'll see next week. We'll, we'll see if we can, like, turn the screens off, and we'll do it next week by memory. Yes? Exodus 33, 17. I'm going to call you to it. All right, here we go. Exodus 33, 17. Let's do it. The Lord answered Moses. I will do this very thing you ask, for you have found favor with me. And I know you by name. Have a great week, church. Love y'all. See you next Sunday.